Hello there, you are watching Alt24 News Live from Algiers, coming up next in our World News Programme. Recently reinstated Prime Minister in the Sudanese government, Abdullah Hamdouk, announced his resignation from his position. Plus, India began immunizing children aged 15 to 18 years with the coronavirus today, Monday, expanding its vaccination efforts to protect the world's largest youth population. And U.S. President Joe Biden assured his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky that if Russia invades its pro-Western neighbor, Washington and its allies would respond decisively. This comes a few days after Putin Biden found call. Also coming up this half hour, Hong Kong independent online news outlet Citizen News is to close on Tuesday after five years in the face of what it described as a deteriorated media environment in the Chinese ruled territory and concerns about the safety of its staff. The Kenyan presidency announced Kenyan paleontologist and politician Richard Leake died Sunday at the age of 77. Hello again and thank you for joining us. The President of the Republic, Mr. Abdel Majid Taboon, received on Sunday in Algiers the Interior Minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Prince Abdel Aziz bin Saud bin Nayef bin Abdel Aziz. The reception took place in the presence of the Director of the Court at the Presidency of the Republic, Mr. Abdel Aziz Khalaf, and the Minister of Interior, Local Authorities and Urban Development, Kamal Biljoud. Recently reinstated Prime Minister in the Sudanese government, Abdullah Hamdouk, announced his resignation from his position. This move was amidst mass protests in Sudan calling for no military interference in politics in the country. Ayadi Usama reports. Abdullah Hamdouk, Sudan's civilian Prime Minister, who has deposed in an October military coup, then restored to power more than a month ago, has stepped down from his position as a Prime Minister in the Sudanese government. His move on Sunday came as mass protests denouncing both the military power grab and its subsequent deal with Hamdouk have gripped Sudan for weeks. Hours before his television address, security forces killed three protesters, according to medics, pushing the number of people killed since the coup to 57. I have decided to announce my resignation, paving the way for another man or woman from the people of our generous country to carry the leadership of our beloved country. I have tried my best to stop the country from sliding towards a disaster. Sudan is crossing now a dangerous turning point that threatens its whole survival. Hamdouk's resignation marks the latest upheaval in the country's fragile transition to democracy, following the 2019 removal of longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir. The November deal that reinstated Hamdouk had called for an independent technocratic cabinet under military oversight, but the agreement was rejected by the pro-democracy movement, which insists power be handed over to fully civilian government. This announcement of Sudan's prime minister throws Sudan's future deeper into uncertainty. Three years after an uprising that led to the overthrow of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir. India began immunizing children aged 15 to 18 years with the coronavirus on Monday, expanding its vaccination efforts to protect the world's largest youth population. On Monday, authorities reported 33,750 new COVID-19 cases and 123 deaths. According to the Ministry of Health, the total number of rapidly spreading Omicron variants found in India was 1,700. Australia's government said the milder impact of the Omicron strain of COVID-19 meant the country could push ahead with plans to reopen the economy even as new infections hit a record of more than 73,000 and the number of people hospitalized rose. Record daily case numbers were reported on Monday in the states of Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania as well as the Australian Capital Territory. 
uh, meeting. The numbers that you're all interested to hear, of course, are the number of new cases yesterday, which was 2,552 new cases. Uh, we have had a further increase in the number of people in hospital in South Australia, up to 94 uh, now, um, and nine of those are uh, in ICU. Uh, the good news is that we have had uh, we have nobody in a hospital at the moment who is on a ventilator, so um, it really is fitting the pattern uh, that this is far more transmissible, but the symptoms are far less uh, than what we were envisaging, of course, uh, with Delta. And of course, the vast majority are all Omicron uh, patients. Uh, so there are 3,685 people in getting uh, treatment in home. Um, we have 10 people in ICU. One person is ventilated. And today I have to report that tragically um, one person in his late 30s has lost his life. Can I say any death during a pandemic is extremely sad. Um, I think the families will be very upset during this time of year as well. And can I pass on to the families our deep condolences. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been confirmed to have COVID-19 as the highly infectious Omicron variant drives a surge in cases across the United States. The Pentagon chief said in a statement Austin's symptoms were mild and he will quarantine at home for the next five days. Public gatherings of more than two people are prohibited under restrictions imposed by the Netherlands in an effort to prevent the Omicron variant of the coronavirus overwhelming an already strained healthcare system. Riot police with buttons and shields broke up a crowd of several thousand who had gathered in Amsterdam on Sunday to protest against COVID-19 lockdown measures and vaccinations. U.S. President Joe Biden assured his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky that if Russia invades its pro-Western neighbor, Washington and its allies would respond decisively. This comes a few days after Putin-Biden phone call. Hasan reports. President Joe Biden talked with Ukraine's leader about Russia's army buildup along its border with Ukraine, vowing that if Russia invades Ukraine, the U.S. and its allies will respond with severe sanctions. He made it clear to the President Putin that he, uh, if he makes any more moves and goes into Ukraine, we will have severe sanctions. We will increase our, our presence in Europe with our NATO allies, and uh, it will have to be a heavy price to pay for it. Biden and President Volodymyr Zelensky's call came as the U.S. and Western allies prepared for a series of diplomatic meetings to try to de-escalate a crisis that Moscow said could rupture ties with Washington. What I got the sense of is that he's agreed that we would have three major conferences in Europe beginning in the middle of the month with our senior staffs that relate to the OSCE, the Russia-NATO Council, as well as continuation of discussions on our strategic doctrine. And so he did not disagree with any of that. And uh, he laid out some of his concerns about NATO and the United States and Europe. And we laid out ours and we said we began to negotiate some of those issues. But I uh, made it clear that they only could work if, in fact, he de-escalated, not escalated. High-ranking U.S. and Russian officials will meet in Geneva to discuss the crisis on January 9th and 10th. There will also be negotiations between Russia and NATO, as well as summit of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The Kremlin, on the other hand, considers the severe sanctions in case happened as an act of war and demands an immediate halt of expansion of NATO eastward. This rise in tension come days after the second call between Putin and Joe Biden took place, tensions that show no sign of ending. South Korean President Moon Jae-in has promised to use his last months in office to push for a diplomatic breakthrough with North Korea, despite Pyongyang's silence on his efforts to secure a declaration of peace between the two countries. In his address on New Year's Eve, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un focused on jump-starting the economy and improving people's lives. 
And now Hong Kong independent online news outlet Citizen News is to close on Tuesday after five years in the face of what it described as a deteriorating media environment in the Chinese ruled territory and concerns about the safety of its staff. Citizen News stated it made the decision with a heavy heart, saying that the news organization was founded in 2017 by experienced journalists dedicated to serving the public and the greater public good through their reporting. The declaration was made on social media on Sunday, less than a week after 200 police officers raided the offices of Stan News, another independent news organization accusing its senior editors of sedition. When Hong Kong was returned to Chinese sovereignty in 1997, Beijing committed to safeguard the territory's freedom and way of life, including free media, for at least 50 years. However, pro-democracy activists and human rights organizations claim that liberties have been undermined, notably since Beijing enforced the national security law on the area in June 2020, following huge democratic rallies in 2019. The shutdown comes only day after senior editors of Stan News were arrested and charged with planning to publish seditious material. They were granted bail. After national security right on its headquarters last year, the enormously people Apple Daily was forced to close. Jimmy Lay, the organization's founder and one of Hong Kong's most outspoken pro-democracy activists, is currently incarcerated on number of crimes. Other senior editors are also being investigated. One person has been found and two are still feared dead after a devastating Colorado fire that burned towns and forced thousands of people to flee. Well, of the three reported missing, one of those persons has been accounted for alive and well, and the search is still ongoing for the remaining two. And Pakistan's natural gas shortage hits the textile industry, the most important export industry in the country. About $250 million of the textiles exports were lost last month after mills in Punjab were forced to shut for 15 days. This puts even more stress on an economy already struggling with accelerating inflation and a weakening currency. Major political parties in Mali have said no to the military government's five-year plan to, for transition to civilian rule. Since August 2020, the military has carried out two coups and postponed elections. Zahra Fergeni reports. The transitional government in Mali says elections scheduled for next month need to be postponed by up to five years, putting off the next presidential election until 2027, despite the deadline set by West African regional mediators. The military junta's proposal included. This five-year period is appropriate to conduct political and institutional reforms, leading to the organization of general and referendum elections. Opposition leaders say the decision by the transitional government is unacceptable. West Africa's regional alliance ECOWAS responded to the junta's proposal by calling for a special meeting by next week. The ECOWAS has already promised more sanctions on Malian officials if there are more delays to the democratic transition. According to the document, the current transitional government led by the coup leader will remain in place until January 2027. Malian Foreign Minister Abdullah Diop said on national television that while the proposal calls for five more years, the transitional government was open to discussions on that. Meanwhile, Mali's junta maintains that elections cannot be held because of deepened insecurity across the country. To Iraq now, where thousands of people rallied in Baghdad to commemorate the second anniversary of the U.S. drone attack that killed a famous Iranian commander and his Iraqi lieutenant, the protesters chanted death to America as they granted or gathered in a Baghdad square to pay tribute to Iran's general Qasim Soleimani, who managed the Quds Force, the Revolutionary Guards External Operations Wing, until his death on January the 3rd, 2020. Miriam Ziani reports. Last year, Iran requested red notices from Interpol against scores of U.S. officials, including Trump, who was also wanted by an Iraqi court. The assassination of Soleimani pushed Iran and the U.S. to the brink of war. On Sunday, in a speech, Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who has pledged serious punishments for Soleimani, said that the assassins would be consigned to the dustbin of history.
Iranian officials are organizing a series of festivities to commemorate the second anniversary of Soleimani's killing, including missile launches against U.S. facilities, where President Ibrahim Raisi and other senior personalities are likely to attend. Iran has urged the UN to take legal action against the US over the assassination of its top general, General Qasem Soleimani, commander of the elite Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps two years ago. In a letter to the UN General Assembly, Iran's presidential legal department urged for all legal actions within its power, including passing a resolution condemning the US administration and discouraging similar actions in the future. Iran claims that the commander of the elite Quds Force was on a diplomatic trip in Iraq's capital, Baghdad, when his convoy was hit by missiles launched by a U.S. drone. And thousands of people gathered in Iraq to commemorate Soleimani's death. A record number of women are due to make up the next Dutch government after the incoming coalition published its list of ministers and secretaries of state on Sunday. An unprecedented 14 out of 29 ministers and secretaries of state will be women, including 10 of the 20 minister ministers. The four-party coalition will be sworn in on January the 10th after reaching a deal in December. A record 271 days after elections in March handing Prime Minister Mark Rutte a fourth term in office. A man has been arrested after a large fire severely damaged the House of Parliament in the South African city of Cape Town. According to the police declarations, the suspect, who is not a parliamentary employee, will appear in court on Tuesday facing charges of arson, housebreaking and theft. The French authorities removed a large flag of the European Union from the Arc de Triomphe in Paris after placing it Friday on the occasion of France's six-month presidency of the European Union. The measure came after the flag's placement angered leaders of the far right. The Turkish lira ended 2021 by losing 44% of its value against the US dollar 19% in the last week of the year alone and tumbled from 18.4 to 10.25, recovering slightly to end the year at 13.19 on Friday. Erdogan announced a plan in December to protect converted local deposits from loose losses against hard currencies, which saw a sharp but brief 50% rally in the lira on support from the central bank. And now rows and tension between Britain and the rest of countries in Europe have been a clear sign of a complicated post-Brexit period in Europe, as many complications appeared on the scene on diplomacy level and most importantly on the economy of the continent. 2021 is the first year for the United Kingdom to operate apart from the European Union. Brexit was the last step taken by the British government towards the European Union, as Boris Johnson worked on tracing new diplomacy borders for his country with the rest of the continent. Many complaints appeared in the United Kingdom after the last decision. This included the new immigration rules in the country, and most businesses suffered, which relied on the freedom of movement of EU workers before Brexit. Restricting free movement has had a devastating impact, but not just on horticulture or agriculture, on, on pretty much every sector where um, people from abroad have been, have been working in those sectors for years and now they're going home. Staff is a serious issue for Britain since the spike of coronavirus around the world and Brexit has made things more difficult for all sectors, including agriculture, hospitality, transportation and a list of other sectors which build the economy of Britain. Biggest issue is staff. We would have had 100, 150 people today picking and it's just down to, what, 25 now. For us it's been very traumatic because of the absolute acute staff shortages and it has been really hard with deliveries. Trade is one more issue for Great Britain as the British government has repeatedly delayed implementing many controls on EU imports, while the EU immediately implemented border controls last January, after the Brexit transition period expired. But that is likely to change. The further red tapes that Britain will implement on the rest of countries in the continent 
are risky measures that will result in price soar and further complicate matters in terms of trade for both sides, especially that London and Brussels have clashed repeatedly over issues ranging from trade in Northern Ireland to coronavirus vaccines. Post-Brexit period does not appear as a smooth period for both sides over Europe, which will surely affect the economy as well as diplomacy. 2021 was a busy year in space exploration and technologies with global superpowers and the mega-rich duking it out for mastery of the cosmos. Here are some of the highlights from the year 2021 with Marwa Bilaywar. The Russian multipurpose laboratory Medul Nuka docked with the International Space Station in July. After 14 years of delays, the long-awaited launch was followed by some issues. After an accidental firing of the module's thrusters sent the ISS into spin. Months later, another Russian module hooked up with the Nuka. This time, the coupling went off without a hitch. NASA's Preservance rover touched down on Martian soil in February. Preservance is the fifth American rover to score the surface of Mars. Within days of landing, it kicked off a first in space exploration when its attached Ingenuity helicopter took off, providing that controlled flight is possible in Mars' atmosphere. China landed its Taiwan 1 rover on Mars in May. Taiwan 1 is China's first vehicle to drive on Mars, and it's having done solidified Beijing's entry into the top tier of space explorers. Reacting to the successful landing, NASA chief Bill Nelson called China a very energetic opponent in what is shaping up to be the space race of the 21st century. The Russian Defense Ministry confirmed in November that it had destroyed a Soviet-era investigation satellite with a precision missile strike. While the satellite was quietly destroyed outside the planet's atmosphere, the political shockwaves back on Earth were loud and immediate. However, Russia alone is not driving the competition to develop space weaponry, and the US, China and India have all tested anti-satellite missiles in the past. After becoming the first private company to send humans into orbit in 2022, Elon Musk's SpaceX continued checking off a list of firsts in 2022. It sent a record of 143 satellites into space on a single mission in January, launched the first crewed flight on a reused space capsule in April, and in September once again made history with the launch of the first all-civilian crew into orbit. This summer, however, all eyes were on Musk's fellow billionaires Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson. Both flew to the edge of space a broadcraft built by their companies, blasting off within weeks of each other, although neither magnate actually entered the orbit. The most powerful space telescope ever built took off from the European Space Agency's launch base in France, Guinea. The 10 billion James Webb Space Telescope is 100 times more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope. While the telescope is being hyped as significantly more powerful than Hubble, it won't serve as a complete replacement to the three-decade-old orbital tool producing mind-blowing multicolored images of deep space. On reaching its destination at the second Sun-Earth language point L2, a million miles away from Earth, the James Webb Telescope will begin scoring the infrared for science of the first stars and galaxies formed after the Big Bang. As a plus, the powerful new tool will allow scientists to peer into the atmospheric composition of exoplanets, aiding the search for Earth-like planets that may harbor life. And now the Kenyan presidency announced Kenyan paleontologist and politician Richard Leake died Sunday at the age of 77. Leake was an environmentalist and a politician and has played a fundamental role in understanding the origins of mankind and strengthening the fight against elephant poachers. Nabil Khazini reports. I said, look, we came in peace and I'm about to leave and please... I'm leaving in peace. World-renowned Kenyan conservationist and politician Richard Leakey died on Sunday at the age of 77. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta announced the news with deep sadness. I have this afternoon received with deep sorrow the sad news of passing away of Dr. Richard Erskine Frerlicky, Kenya's former head of public service. Richard Leakey rose to prominence by unearthing clues that helped prove the evolution of humanity in Africa. It's a natural heritage site with uh, evidence of prehistory, not just of the ancestry of humanity, 
that the ancestry of the African fauna is better represented there than anywhere in the world. During one of his digs in 1984, Leakey's made one of his most famous findings, the uncovering of an extraordinary oldest near complete Homo erectus skeleton, which was nicknamed Turkana Boy. The skeleton dates back to 1.5 million years ago. Five years later, he was asked by the former president Daniela Rap Moy to head the Kenyan Wildlife Service. There, he led a vigorous campaign against the poaching of elephant ivory. We can burn ivory and do all these things, but unless we can persuade the public why we're doing it, we'll be wasting our time. Ivory must be seen as only valuable if it's on an animal. It should not be ever seen as a valuable commodity for trade. His campaign made him lots of enemies. Leakey lost his two legs in a plane crash in what he later said it was a failed attempt to kill him. Son of Mary and Louis Leakey, both were maybe the world's most famous paleontologists and archaeologists. It was perhaps inevitable that Richard would become a successful fossil hunter. And finally, waste faced with a surgence or resurgence of the disease, many African nations like Gambia found themselves without players and had to cancel friendly games. On Wednesday, January the 5th, 2022, Algerian national team will be able to play the first and possibly last preparation match for the 2022 African Cup of Nations against Ghana, a meeting which is not likely to be cancelled according to the communications officer of the GFA, Henry Aste. And then um, Switzerland, including the home base players that we brought from, from Accra to, to Qatar. And we're expecting about three players tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening. And um, our players, you know, we have about seven players in, in England. We have Wallacott who plays for Swindon Town, we have Thomas Pate, Jordan Ayu, um, Andy Adam, Baba Rahman. Um, who are all based in, in England. And then Daniel Amate, who plays for Leicester City, who is also in England. So we're expecting these players to arrive latest, um, 3rd of January. Um, hopefully when they arrive and they are in good condition, um, they will have at least one day to train, you know, before the, the game against Algeria. But That's all for this half hour. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.